Today is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. It is also the feast day of St. Egidius. In English, we know him as St. Giles. And from his feast day is the second oration of the Mass today. And there's a third oration also invoking the intercession of the 12 brother martyrs who died in love, out of love for our Lord in the early days of the church. Now, as you see, the Mass now is being offered for the reporters of what, supporters of what Catholics believe. And each month, I do offer one Mass for the intentions of those who support the program, and I thank you very much for that. In fact, I do have in the bulletin today a list of the topics covered in the last program. You might look at that and see what's of interest to you or those you know, and use it as a resource to help those uh, who you know learn more about the faith. Now notice that the Mass tomorrow is at 8.30 in the morning, but uh, that Tuesday's Mass at 8 o'clock, and then on Wednesday we begin the academic year schedule of having the Mass for the students at 10.50 in the morning, beginning Wednesday, that is. Notice that this Friday, well, I should say Tuesday, September 3rd, Tuesday is the Feast of St. Pius X, great patron, and so we invoke him it is the anniversary of the ordinations of Father Greenwell and Father Bomber, so we celebrate their anniversaries also on that day, September 3rd, the Feast of St. Pius X. Now, this coming Friday is the first Friday of the month of September, and Saturday, the first Saturday. So if you're making the first Fridays and Saturdays, be sure and be prepared to do so this weekend, or this, this coming Friday and Saturday. And notice that over that night, we have all night adoration, I thank those who have been so faithful to their pledges throughout all these years to be spend the hour before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament here on the altar. I'm sure it is an hour full of many blessings and graces for you and your families. Notice next Sunday is the Feast of the Nativity of Our Blessed Mother, a very beautiful feast day of Our Lady, uh, one of a series of feast days of Our Blessed Mother throughout September and into October. Now. Because we finished the 54-day Rosary Novena, uh, some have come forward and asked for a second 54-day Rosary Novena. In other words, they want to continue those prayers because of the upcoming elections, which will determine very much the destiny of our country, or I should perhaps some would say the fate of our country. And so it was suggested, and I thought it was a very good suggestion, to uh, resume a second 54-day Rosary Novena on September 8th, the Feast of the Nativity of Our Blessed Lady. That would mean that we'd have this second 54-day Rosary Novena continuing throughout the month of September into October and concluding on the last day, the 31st day of October, a very significant date. It is in October that Our Blessed Mother actually fulfilled her promise of a great miracle, the miracle of the sun. It was also in October, at least it was in October in Russia, that the Bolsheviks took power and Russia began to spread her errors throughout the world, as Our Lady predicted. So these, these rosaries are extremely important to us at this time. October 31st is just days before our national elections when such fateful decisions must be made. So I encourage you, please, Please join that 54-day Rosary Novena beginning on next Sunday, September 8th, the feast day of Our Lady's birth. Now, I also bring to your attention that we are celebrating the ordination to the priesthood of Reverend Mr. of now Reverend Michael Butler, Father Michael Butler. We thank God for his ordination, and we will be celebrating his ordination to the priesthood. This coming October 7th, he will offer a solemn mass here on that feast of the most holy rosary of our blessed lady. That's a Monday evening at 5 p.m. And then afterwards there will be a dinner served nearby as it was last year for Father Harbor and Father Peter. So we will celebrate Father Butler's ordination. Now please call the school office and let them know you'd like reservations for that. Mrs. Lawson is out of the office for the time being because she is recovering 
from surgery, and I ask you to please keep her in your prayers. So call the school office and let us know that you want reservations for that dinner on the night of October 7th. The following day, the actually three priests who come with one seminarian and also three of the sisters from Roundtop coming also for a day of recollection on October 8th, the Feast of St. Bridget. And we're going to have a second collection on the fourth Sunday of September. We don't usually have a second collection on the fourth Sundays of the month, but we will into September to help defray the costs of transportation for the priests and the sisters coming in for the solemn mass of Father Butler, the celebration, and also the day of recollection the following day. So please be prepared for that. You don't have to wait for that fourth Sunday collection, though. If you want to contribute in advance, that would be a wonderful thing and appreciate it very much. Now, please join us for the public rosary downtown today at 2 o'clock at the Hamilton County Courthouse. We'll pray the 15 decades of the rosary. We'll ask God to have mercy on ourselves, of course, but upon our families and upon our country, which is so much, so much in need of those prayers right now. It seems that our country is hanging in the balance, as it were, right now. We may not need to pull it back from the edge by virtue of our prayers. Please join us for that rosary at 2 o'clock at the county courthouse today. Now, the bands of matrimony are announced for the third time for Benjamin Pegram and Cecilia Leininger. Uh, the bands are announced. The priest is supposed to say that if anyone knows of a reason why these two fine souls are not to be joined in holy matrimony, they should let the priest know. But also to ask you to pray for them as they prepare for their wedding day. Now, I do ask your prayers, please, for those who are ill and suffering for some of the deceased. Just in the last few days, Ned Nelson passed away after a long, well, I can't say a lengthy bout, but a very intense, acute bout with serious illness. So please keep Ned's soul in your prayers and keep his loved ones in your prayers too because they are suffering mightily from his passing. It seemed to come so suddenly. I know you've been praying for him and I have confidence your prayers are heard favorably. And I do ask your prayers also for also a gentleman who just passed away, known for quite some time. Please um, keep in your prayers. Uh, well, John Pfeiffer of Kentucky, please always remember him in your prayers. And also Jim Grieve, please remember his dear soul in your prayers as well. And among those who last I heard were alive but struggling for life, please remember Catherine LaRue. And remember, well, Paul Riley is recovering, we pray, from that accident of a couple of years ago. Please pray for him, Paul and his family. Pray for Cliff Hogan and Cheryl Johnson, for Marion Shohan and for Margaret Bolas, for our friend Adonizio and Lisa Capetillo's sister, Jeannie, who is undergoing some very sensitive brain surgery coming up soon. Please pray for her and her loved ones as well. And for Joe Percher, there are so many. Ask our Blessed Mother to take those we've committed to her Immaculate Heart and present them to our Lord asking for mercy. Now we do have the air conditioner running and we can actually leave the air conditioner running. Now we don't have to keep turning it on and off for further work. And uh, I notice that not only is it running effectively, but it's running more quietly than ever before. It doesn't seem to be laboring as it used to. And I thank those who made it possible to do this repair. It is a great help. And also I mentioned to you the golf outing on September 22nd very important event for us. Not only is it a time to <coughs> join your fellow parishioners on the, on the course uh, in that gigantic garden, which we call a, a, a golf course, but also uh, an opportunity to benefit the church and the school greatly. 
I appreciate very much those over the years who made that so successful and are even now trying to make it successful for us. I ask you to please help them every way. Sign up, offer to, to work, to um, play uh, on one of the foursomes, bring a foursome of your own. Please support this uh, worthy endeavor in every way you can, and I appreciate that very much. I understand that come Tuesday, we may well have uh, our first of our new doors adorning the front of the church. An enormous set of work is going into those, and they should be very handsome indeed when they are in place. And I thank those who have contributed time and effort, talent and energy to making that happen. It, it is certainly what they call a major upgrade. So thank you for doing this for this church dedicated to Our Lady's Immaculate Conception and where our Lord is still present with us even to this moment. Uh, thank you for doing this for our Lord. Now the epistle for this, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be made desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, and if a man be overtaken in any fault, you who are spiritual, instruct such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so you shall fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something, whereas he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and so he shall have glory in himself only, and not in another. For every one shall bear his own burden. And let him that is instructed in the word communicate to him that instructeth him in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For what things a man shall sow, those also shall he reap. For he that soweth in his flesh of the flesh also shall reap corruption. But he that soweth in the spirit of the spirit shall reap life everlasting. And in so doing, good let us not fail. For in due time we shall reap, not failing. Therefore, whilst we have time, let us work good to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. Luke, chapter 7. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus went into a city called Naim, and there went with him his disciples and a great multitude and when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a great multitude of the city was with her, whom when the Lord had seen being moved with mercy towards her, he said to her, Weave not. <coughs> and he came near and touched the bier, and they that carried it stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet is risen among us, and God hath visited his people. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. Young man, I say to thee, arise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. <clears throat> My dear faithful, in today's epistle to the Galatians, St. Paul might seem to contradict himself. At one point he says, bear ye one another's burdens. And in doing so, you shall fulfill the law of Christ. But then, later on, St. Paul says, every one of us shall bear his own burden. <clears throat> and how is it possible that St. Paul would admonish us to share the burdens of others, and yet that we must carry that burden alone? Well, it's very clear St. Paul is saying that in this life, 
here and now, on this life, we must care for each other, bear each other's burdens. How do we do that? By the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. This is the way we share each other's burdens here in this life, to try to ease the load and the burden for each other. <clears throat> but when we die and we have to appear before our Lord for judgment, then each one of us will have to appear alone and bearing his own burden and answering for what he did with the life and the time and the graces and the blessings that God has given him in this life. Yes, here we can share one another's burdens. When we stand for judgment, we will have to bear our own burden before our Lord. Now, as I say, we have the seven corporal and seven spiritual works of mercy. And one of those spiritual works of mercy is to admonish the sinner. And St. Paul talks about that in the epistle today. He says when you have to correct someone, do it in a spirit of meekness or humility, not out of pride. And that's very, very important advice because we may know from experience, if we correct someone out of our pride, then the issue becomes not their sin, but our arrogance and our pride, and it ruins everything. Whereas if we have to correct someone for their fault, if we do it out of a spirit of humility and meekness, uh, remembering that we too are mortal flesh and subject to temptation, and that we can easily fall also. So if we correct them out of humility, they can accept it in good grace and hopefully benefit by it. This is what is meant to ad admonish the sinner. But St. Paul says also that if we sow, and he talks about this as though we go through life, we're sowing seed. It's like we're dropping seeds everywhere to grow around us. It's like we're the sower out in the field with the seed. By our words and our actions, we're sowing seeds, and the seeds are either of this world, of pride and arrogance and impurity and immodesty and so on. And if this is the seed that we're planting by our words and actions, this is what is going to grow, he said, and it's going to be the seeds of corruption are going to grow everywhere because these are the things that lead to hell. <clears throat> Finally, we're going to have to plant the body, our bodies in this world, and there you will see true corruption, what sin does to the body. But St. Paul says if we, in word and action, plant seeds of the Holy Ghost, of the inspiration of God and his grace, then when those seeds germinate and they grow, they will grow unto everlasting life. Now this is the seed we should be planting in the world today. By our words and our actions, we should be planting the seeds of everlasting life by the grace of God given through our spirits from the Holy Ghost himself. Now in the gospel today, our Lord talks about the the man who had died and was being carried out of the city of Naim. <clears throat> and even the very name of the city is very pleasing because the word Naim means pleasing or beautiful or beauty. This is the root of the word in Hebrew and actually carrying over it to be used in the Greek today for beauty or beautiful. And he's being carried out of that city or village by his mother. She is following the stretcher, and behind her comes a throng of people. And meeting them at the gate of the city, it must have been very small gate, I guess, for a village. But there's another multitude of people coming into the city, led by our Lord himself. And the gospel tells us that when our Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And it's interesting, I think, that the gospel doesn't say our Lord had compassion on the poor dead man whose corpse was lying on the stretcher and being taken out for burial. Our Lord had compassion on his mother who was left behind because she was a widow and this was her only son. If she had other children, if she had daughters, they're not mentioned anywhere, even not mentioned being with her in that funeral procession to bury what would be their brother. She seemed to be very much alone, even though she was followed by 
a lot of people from the city. She seemed so very much alone there. And she was weeping, and she was facing some very hard times because according to Jewish law at the time, she could not have inherited the estate of her husband who was already dead. It was the son who could have inherited that estate, but he was dead too. If there had been daughters, they could have inherited too, but only if they had married within their tribe and their family, as it were, their extended family, because the Jewish law was made to keep the, the land within the family, <clears throat> to keep the estate within the family and its family name. And so the only way the wife would receive the inheritance, let's say, of her husband's passing, was if she, again, was a Le Levitical wife, as they called it, and then went on to marry the, man, the dead man's brother. So it was a little complicated system. The point being, though, that a, a widow could be left quite destitute. If her husband passed away and she had no children to inherit, and this was perhaps the fate of this poor woman. Our Lord had compassion on her. And you see what happened. He said to her, do not weep. He approached. To approach the corpse made oneself liable to be ritually unclean and have to go through this ritual of being cleansed there after that. But our Lord, our Lord approached the corpse, touched the bier or the stretcher on which it was being carried. Immediately, those who were carrying it stopped <clears throat> and our Lord commanded the young man to live. He was, in fact, a young man. He said, young man, I say to you, I say to you, I say to you, the Son of God, I say to you, arise. And Almighty God, this divine person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, commanded the soul of this young man dead man to return from wherever it was, reunite with his body, animate it, and live. And so the young man immediately sat up <clears throat> and began to speak. There was no doubt he was alive. You can imagine everyone must have stood there transfixed for a moment, wondering what was happening. Is this possible? And then our Lord presented this young man alive to his mother. There was so much rejoicing and they recognized the greatness of this miracle, that they actually said God has visited his people in the person of Jesus Christ, and so true that was. Now that's important for you and me to see there the power and compassion of our Lord. We've all lost loved ones, some of us recently, and it's very hard for us. But our confidence is in our Lord, who has greater power than we have, obviously, by so great a margin, he has infinite power, but his love is so much greater also, even for our loved ones. He loves them so much more than you and I ever could. Now you and I might say, I would lay down my life for my father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my child, my son, my daughter. I would love down my, lay down my life for my friend. We might say that. And yet there's one who in fact did lay down his life for the souls of our loved ones and ourselves. And that is the Son of God who took a human life precisely to sacrifice it so that you and I might live. And it is in that love of that God and the power of that God that we place all of our hope for what St. Paul speaks of in the epistle today, the seed of everlasting life. Now, we come to a point in our country where we wonder When our country is dying, we wonder, is something happening to our own country? And it's important for us to take stock. There are those who are asking some questions, and I thought, since I'll be away the next couple of Sundays, I would address a couple of questions that have come up. And one of them has to do with what we are, what we are doing for our country. And we should be praying, as I ask you to pray the rosary each day and the 54-day rosary novena coming up September 8th. But we should be going through the day offering every sacrifice we can think of for our country. 
And often, I'm afraid, we miss the things that could do so much good. And I make a recommendation to you that you begin to offer up every drive, every drive you make, whether you're driving to the church, you're driving to the grocery store, driving to school, wherever you're going. Offer that drive. I know you make the morning offering to God every, every day, as you should. That's a good thing. But time and time again, we hear about frustrations on the road with accidents, bad weather, slowdowns, and so on and so forth. And we hear about how frustrating that is. I think every one of us has experienced that, perhaps even this morning. Well, what I would recommend that every one of us do is dedicate those moments to the Sacred Heart of Jesus for our country as a sacrifice, that we will offer our patience and our perseverance to our Lord there at that point. Every day we have the opportunity to make an offering like that on our drives wherever they take us because, well, let's face it, there are many things that happen on the road that are very aggravating, irritating, maybe even angering, and we have an opportunity there to practice patience. How great is that? Our Lord tells us it is by our patience that we will possess our souls, that Satan will not possess them, but we will, by our patience. And so why waste all of that opportunity to offer that patience to our Lord? We can offer it in reparation for our own sins, certainly a worthy cause. We can offer it for the conversion of a loved one in our own family, maybe who's lost the faith or at least is not practicing their faith. We could offer it for them. But we could also, at least in part, offer it imploring God's mercy for our country. So I, I just make a recommendation that every one of us dedicate every drive for that. I know you pray when you set out, when you, before you leave the driveway, before you leave the parking lot, you make the sign of the cross, you offer prayers for the drive, for a safe drive, I understand that. But perhaps we should also be asking God to accept our patience every drive as an act of sacrifice motivated by our love for him and our love for our country and ask him to accept that. Now, there are those who uh, also ask about voting, something that we need to do with regard to our country. You know, recently we celebrated the feast day of St. Raymond Nonatus. His name means Raymond the Non-Born, because all the way back in the 1200s, he was taken by Caesarian when his mother had died. And he was delivered so that he could live. And he lived as though his entire life had been forfeit to God. Finally, he entered a religious order that was established to ransom captives of Muslim slaveholders. Islam has been, and it remains today, the greatest slaving, slavery enterprise in the history of mankind. And so in the 1200s already, 600 years after the death of Mohammed, this man, Raymond, entered a religious order and took a vow that he would go in exchange for a Muslim slave, a Catholic who had been captured on the coasts of Italy or France and had been taken away to slavery in Northern Africa. A father, a brother, a son, he would replace one of them, take his place in slavery. And St. Raymond, arriving as a voluntary slave in Africa, began to preach the gospel there. And he was so effective that he was converting Muslims to believe that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Savior, the Son of God. So successful was he in conversions that finally some very cruel overlord with a hot poker pierced his lips, his upper and lower lip, and put a padlock on his mouth so that he could not speak of Christ. And that he endured for quite some time. He was finally freed and returned home again. And there he lived out his life again, a very saintly advocate, practicing the 
spiritual and the corporal works of mercy and bearing the burdens of others. This was his sanctity. When you hear about a saint like that whose feast day we just celebrated, you realize that the greatest hardship we had to suffer here was just doing without air conditioning for a few months. And here he was. And we realize that we really should not have too many complaints. We have a feast day coming up very soon of St. Teresa, the child Jesus. Now, young St. Teresa did not go into slavery into Africa. She spent about half of her life in a religious convent, a cloister. But she became there a patron of the missionary work of the church throughout the whole world by the generosity of her offerings. And what she did was she took the little things she did every day, whether it was mopping the floor, washing the dishes, doing the laundry, it didn't matter, and she offered that wholeheartedly to Lord, our Lord, doing the very best she could for him. So the works she did were not considered great works, but she did them with great love. And they were so powerful that the Pope who canonized her said he considered her the greatest saint of modern times. <clears throat> and that's what you and I can do. And that's why I recommend that among the things we do is to offer our drives each day a little thing but we can offer that lovingly to our Lord and follow the example of St. Teresa. Now, another question that came up, I said, is a matter of voting. And this is problematic today because, well, let's, let's take a hypothetical situation. Let's say you were in a country where there are political parties. Let's say there were two dominant political parties that drew all the press and all the funding and so on, and they both supported abortion and they both supported perversion in immorality. What would you do? How could you vote? How could you choose? Well, you could simply refuse to vote, but you realize that in a situation like that, not voting is effectively voting already because of the fact that you are not raising your voice, that that is a resounding silence on your part, in the face of all of this evil. So you realize, well, okay, I should vote, but should I vote for the lesser of two evils? As they say, this is a teaching that has been around for a long, long time. The church has her moral theology doctrine about this. And uh, we hear this said election after election in our own country about voting for the lesser of two evils. Well, if you return to that hypothetical country where these two parties both were representing evil things, could you be in a situation where you would choose between two evils? But you would say, well, wait a minute, even if I'm voting for a party that promotes evil, even if it's, if it's the lesser of the two evils, it's still evil, and I'm still voting for evil. How can I vote for evil? One party says that they will support, hypothetically, abortion on demand until birth, accounting for millions of abortions. And the other says, well, we only want to restrict abortion to very few, relatively few, limited time, and so on and so forth. But it's still abortion, it's still murder. How can I support even one abortion? Isn't that still voting for evil? And that's a very, very serious question. It troubles people. It has troubled me, too, actually about this question of supporting evil. But the church has said, actually, the way the Catholic must look at that is to say, look, I'm not voting for any evil. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm voting for all of the evil that will not be done. That's what I'm mindful of. I'm thinking in terms of the evil that can be avoided. And it is that that I cast my vote for. The lesser of two evils is not voting for the evil, it's rather voting for the evils that will not be done, that would be avoided, if one side won and the other side did not. Well, I'll tell you, even that still concerns me. And so, it would seem that in that hypothetical country where one had only that choice, effectively, one could actually look at it this way, and I think it is a correct way of looking at it. Let's say one party said, 
we are in favor of complete unrestricted abortion and perversion, and we promote it, and furthermore, we will punish you if you resist it. We will prevent you from denouncing it. We will prevent you from seeking against it. And if you try to resist these evils, we, we will punish you and imprison you. We will fine you. You have no right to speak out against these things. And the other party, let's say, says, well, yes, officially, we do support some of these evil things to some extent. But we do not restrict your right to speak out against these things. You have the right to speak out against these things. You have the right to condemn them. And we cannot and will not punish you for speaking against these evil things. So if you see that you have to speak and demonstrate and resist these evils, you have the right to do so, and we recognize your right to do so. Now, could one say then, well, I can vote for something positive, something good. I can vote for my right to resist evil. I can vote for my, re my right and my responsibility to speak out against it, to condemn it, and to work against it, and to try to convince my country not to do these things. Is that not voting for something positive? My right to resist evil, is that not something positive? A God-given right there. Or if someone says, well, we do officially recognize perversion, but we also recognize you have the right to resist that, and right to resist it, to speak against it. And we will protect that right, and you will not be punished for exercising that right at all. Now, again, is that not something positive to say, well, I, I can vote for the right to resist this evil, to speak against it and to work against it, and to try to convince the, the people of my country to reject it. Is that not something positive? So in voting, can I not vote for my right to resist these evil things? And my freedom, my liberty to do so. And I think that yes, you can. In that sense, you're voting for something very positive indeed and very necessary. It's not just voting for the lesser of two evils then. It takes on a certain different character of voting for what is good and what is to be preserved and fought for. You know, when in the despot, despotisms and the, the uh, despotic dictatorships, the ty tyrannies of the world today, we find the criminals rise to the top and take control. When the criminals take control in any society, they try to turn the entire government into one enormous criminal enterprise where they reward the bad, they reward evil, and they punish the good. And this must be resisted. You and I realize <coughs> that by our <coughs> physical means, we're very limited. We realize that it is God himself we call upon to vanquish evil, wherever it may be, in our own souls, in the souls of others, in our society. We know that only God has the power to overcome these things, which is why we pray as we do, including our rosaries, which is why we offer sacrifices as we do, our patience. We ultimately realize that these are like votes. We're voting for God when we do these things. We're voting our conscience, which is a Catholic conscience, out of faith and hope and love for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're calling upon Almighty God to take action in his own way, in his own time. But we trust him. Still compassionate, ever compassionate as he was, as he saw this woman carrying her only son out to be buried. So we might fear our country is even now being prepared for burial. We may fear that. But we do trust that by virtue of our prayers and our sacrifices, that same compassionate Lord who raised the widow's son to life, that he, the life-giving Son of God, can stop those carrying the stretcher 
and so command that life be given, that the spirit spoken of by St. Paul in today's gospel epistle return, and once again he may restore to life our beloved country. We call it the land of the free and the home of the brave, but perhaps we can also think of it a bit like that village from which the corpse was being removed today and to which the young man returned alive. His village, known as beautiful. Well, our country is very beautiful, and we ask Almighty God to have mercy. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.